The furthest I would go now is to say we are not going to lose. That's not oh, entirely the same thing right. as, as winning. Although, of course, given the gigantic scale of the gap between ourselves and the Conservatives in 2019 mm. and the size of the swing that will be required to give us a majority, a bare majority, yes. uh, it, it does mean that um, anyone who was taking the possibility of a Labour government with a working majority mm. for granted... Is a fool. Okay, I mean, it's a bit of. Um, I want to just start by just invoking your your memory a little bit, Neil. I mean, you remember. That's always dodgy with well, maybe one year old. Yeah. <laughs> give it a shot. Just give it a shot. You might remember because I do. Um, a year, a few years back, <clears throat> Jeremy Corbyn was still leader of the Labour Party, and we sat down for an interview. I was doing a, um, a panorama documentary at the B BBC, and you told me in the course of that interview <clears throat> you feared we would never see another Labour government in your lifetime well here you are you're sitting there yes and uh, and, and look, the word is the polls suggest that a labor government after the next election is perfectly possible maybe even likely i want to ask you as someone who is quite open about speaking from the heart about your emotions it makes you a human being neil i mean how are you feeling about that now i'm feeling almost confident but not a scintilla of complacency. That's such a corny I'm, answer. I mean, well, of course it is, of course. But, I mean, it's the only way I can answer you. Yeah. Um, I mean, it actually, fortunately, happens to be my real opinion. Uh, that quote that you used earlier on, perfectly accurately, about me in the depths of the Corbyn chasm. Um, <laughs> Corbyn chasm. I, I did very slightly qualify it mm. in hope and a little bit of anger, I guess, um, because I said, unless things change radically, yeah. and I think I think I might have said rapidly, uh, and here we are, what, I don't know, six, seven years on, and things have changed. That's very fortunate. Yes. It's still not, still not, is conclusive enough. You mentioned the word verdict earlier yeah. on. I often know it's really. not conclusive enough. I, but if, if a 20 no. point lead is not enough to make you feel confident in your heart, your innermost heart, what are you waiting for? Well, the furthest I would go now is to say we are not going to lose. That's not oh, entirely the same thing right. as, as winning. Although, of course, given the gigantic scale of the gap between ourselves and the Conservatives in 2019 mm. and the size of the swing that will be required to give us a majority, a bare majority, Yes, uh, it, it does mean that um, anyone who was taking the possibility of a Labour government with a working majority mm. for granted is a fool. OK, I mean, it's a bit of an echo of Lord Mandelson, your old sparring partner. Well, he, just... he echoes me, I never echo him. OK, okay, okay. <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll take that. I wonder, are you still burned... Neil, by, by 1992, when you... I don't know how many people really remember it, but you famously leapt onto that stage at Sheffield. Oh, that you, was... You punched yeah, the air. That was you irrelevant. said, we're all right. And that no, was seen I as didn't, I over, didn't, overconfident. I'm not sure you I were actually that didn't, confident, but... didn't actually say that. Um, no, I wasn't all that confident because I thought that m maybe a hung parliament was a possibility in the first week of that campaign. Mm. But that faded, uh, both with our own private polling, which yeah. was very detailed and effective and yes. also the sentiment the way in which yes. myself and indeed my wife glennis yes. who is a a long uh, established political practitioner sure. and one of the greatest canvases i've ever come across yeah. in my life and um we know it was fading away from us uh, just but on that, that, on that, Neil, Rally, on that I, I remember, just before Once on. again, clear the record. Yeah. I didn't say okay. we were all right. I stupidly, inanely indeed, uh, with this crowd of 13,000 people, uh, it was yes. like opening a furnace door. Yeah. Uh, and to get it calmed down, I said, well, what rock and roll performers have said since time immemorial, yeah. well, all right. That's right. I, I mean, <laughs> you were a bit of rock star, oh, and it came out the way, <laughs> out the wrong way. Well, maybe a lesson, a lesson learned there. Oh, uh, yes. let, let, let us talk about today's 
leader. Neil, you were, because I remember every day of your leadership, you were, a, you were a charismatic and a passionate leader. Now, opinions in the country polarised about you as a candidate for prime minister, but you were a bit of a political force of nature. And after, John, after you, John Smith, he, yeah. was, he was often compared to a bank manager, but he was a, a much trusted bank manager and he was much loved by the party. Now, your, your great hero in politics is the great Nye Bevan. Yes. And we know that Tony Blair didn't lack all charisma, among, among other things. Now, Keir Starmer, I guess, on the other hand, he's most often described as, as deeply boring. And there's been, there's been so many surveys. You know word clouds when the pollsters put together the most often used yes. words about someone. Yes. The biggest word on Keir Starmer's word cloud is boring. And people, people that they say, no doubt sincerely, they don't know what he stands for. Now, I'm not going to ask you if that's a problem because you're going to say, no, no, it isn't. And the party is 20 points ahead. But do you believe, Neil, this country will come to love Keir Starmer better over time if he's lucky enough to get into office? Uh, love is something to which politicians can only aspire. Uh, high regard, trust, that's different. And I'm absolutely certain that Keir Starmer has got the qualities of utter dependability, maturity, yes. high intelligence, patriotism, yeah. that will bring people to hold him in high regard and say, I'm glad we've got this guy as prime minister. Now, as it happens, that's all in his nature. Uh, he's a perfectly normal bloke, uh, but he's got very well-developed talents. Yeah. And it's all in his nature, those descriptions, those adjectives I've used. But in addition, it happens to be a time in which what we need after the clowning, the corruption, the mm. carousing, uh, the tomfoolery of the last five or six years is reliability, yes. dependability, honesty, patriotism, and maturity. All those characteristics are Keir Starmer's. So he's the right man for the right time. Yeah, yeah. Look, I mean, a, a student of the Labour Party might say that that uh, Clem Attlee, judged to be one of the greatest, yes. say the greatest prime yes. minister of the 20th century, was thought to be even well into his premiership, never mind the decades before, to be the most boring, nondescript, yes. non-entity on the on the planet. Keir Starmer's no Clem Attlee, is he? No, no, and he, he doesn't aspire to be Clem Attlee, and he's not uh, Harold Wilson. And do you know the reason for that is... Everybody who leads a party and aspires to lead the country is a first. You can find elements uh, what, that they have in is, common. In what respect is Keir Starmer a first? Uh, that he, first of all, <laughs> he's, he will be the first leader of the Labour Party to become Prime Minister, if and when we win, yeah. that didn't go to a public school. OK. That might be a start. Uh, he's also authentically working class. And I think maybe Ramsay MacDonald or... Yeah, Ramsay MacDonald was, I think, uh, who went out in 1931, the last of those. So, I, you know, it's no good digging around archaeologically to try and find common characteristics. Regard each leader yeah. and prime minister yeah. as a first. Indeed, no, nobody regard knew. most people as a first. You yeah. look at sports people yeah. and they say, oh, he's another this, he's yeah, another I that. that. I get that. The fact that they are outstanding is that they are the first. Yeah, look, I mean, look, nobody ever doubted what you stood for, um, but they don't know what Keir Starmer stands for. Is he going to fix that? Well, Does he have been, to fix that? They haven't been listening in that case. Because, I mean, he stands for those qualities that I mentioned. Mm. That's for certain. Inbuilt bone marrow. And that is a fundamental qualification as far as I'm concerned. But in addition, uh, he is worked all his life to make justice commonplace and easily accessible to mm. people. He is utterly committed to the securing the green transition, okay. which is fundamentally required not just to protect us against cataclysmic climate change, but actually is the fount of industrial prosperity and growth. With the modern industries, the bio-industries, the high-tech industries, steel, which is fundamental yeah. and vital and very close to my heart, all those things. He's, you can't uh, in, study Keir Starmer at all okay. and not know that 
there is utter clarity of commitment. Okay, there. You, 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 you answered that question. When and if Labour gets into office, the fact is they will not be able to fix our public services and no. fix problems in, in our society, not in a single term, maybe not over a much longer period. And people, as you know, aren't always patient and they won't be patient after years of getting poorer and seeing our public services strained in the way that they are. Labour, Neil, is going to have to be prepared, isn't it, to be deeply unpopular. Do you think the party, your party has got the nerve for that? I don't think that's the real test. You're right to say... No, but it's the test I'm setting, because yeah, it's surely okay. coming. Yeah, fine, OK. I mean, if they're searching around for love all the time, they will not be re requited, requited. If they're trying to do the right thing and giving evidence of it, people will exercise patience, uh, which it will go deeper than the tolerance they've ex exercised over the last 14 years, yeah. in which, exactly as you say... Our vital public services, yeah. not peripheral things, vital public services, uh, the damage to those is deep yeah. and very wide. Isn't that wishful thinking? And isn't no, that wishful it isn't thinking, wishful thinking no. because I, if I'm going to make a historic parallel on the scale of damage to the public domain, basic life or death, chance or no chance services, housing, health, education, go down the list, uh, the police, law and order, go down the list, all very severely damaged. We are in a post-war mm. situation. It's as if our country has been assaulted for the last 14 mm. years. There's no other way to mm. uh, factually describe it. People don't, now, people don't elect a party for, for one term, for two so, terms. I know. You're elected for a, for a term in the hope that you're going to deliver on the basis of that. And they've got to demonstrate in right. the course and people of are going to be first, disappointed, yes, aren't they? Yes, and they've got to demonstrate conclusively in the course of that first term that everything they're doing is striving to repair and renew. Renewal is critical because in some respects, repair simply won't be enough. Mm. Where there's things left to repair because that presumes that there's enough intact for you to build upon mm. it. In some cases, okay. it's been virtually obliterated. So consequently, the important thing in that first term is to show the confidence, the commitment, the audacity, it requires some boldness too, so that people are convinced deep down that they really are trying yeah. and that no one would make a better fist of it. Audacity no. is not a word that comes to mind when you look at the way the Labour Party is setting out its stall at the moment. They're much more often, and oh. I think not unfairly, accused of being very, no. very cautious. If you commit, and they've repeatedly committed and will deliver, on a £3 billion package in order to save and develop and modernise British steel, for instance, you can't say this is a group of people lacking in boldness. Mm. When they make the commitment to free breakfasts for the huge majority of kids in Britain, mm. that is not lacking in boldness. Mm. And it's fundamentally required okay. in the state of affairs today. So, let me, let me ask so you we can now. go down the list. Let me ask you this now, because we've got limited time. We always have, sure. of course, limited time. Look, if there's to be a Labour government, one of the first things it's going to inherit is going to be a very, very restless body of public sector workers yes. and unions that represent them. There's been something like warfare in the public space when it comes yes. to industrial relations. And when and if there's a Labour government, again, you know the unions, unions are not going to be accommodating whoever wins the next election. Now, we don't know who's going to win that election. Let's make that clear. We've got to show right. respect to voters who have yes. not voted yet. Yes. But the days are long gone when trade unions and trade union leaders might be willing to cut the Labour Party some slack, haven't they? I think it would be difficult to demonstrate that they ever really did, especially in conditions of economic pressure. You were there, John. I was there back in 1978-79, the winter of discontent. And the fact that there was a Labour government that was delivering on the social contract and was restraining uh, unemployment and trying to sustain levels of commitment to essential public services, that didn't persuade everybody when they were falling four, five, six, eight percent mm. behind in real terms. So it's not going to be easy.
But well, they'll have to show some strength well, in standing yes, sure, up to sure, unions sure. because that will be the but, job of a government. Yes, and the union's going to have to show some strength too in acknowledging the scale of reduction in standards of investment, commitment, expenditure, employment, and the host of issues that surround those things, and knowing that miracles are not going to be performed, and that promises made of restoration in very uh, short time would be meaningless. Now, they're all grown-ups, and they will understand that. Not that we're protecting a vested interest or trying to sustain a stale, dour, uh, dead status quo, but we're dealing with the realities. And that message has got to go out. And I think that the majority of workers uh, and their leaderships will comprehend that as long as what they see simultaneously is real evidence, practical evidence of striving for greater justice really? Does that, does that cut ice with the society. Royal College of Nurses, with the doctors, with, with, with transport workers, seeing evidence of Yeah, my mother hard. was a member of the RCN and a very profound socialist and trade unionist, great woman. And she uh, would have comprehended why, because I know she did in 1945, in 1947, in 1948. And she and her generation went through all the miseries of slump, war, and everything that followed from the war, mm. and they knew that coming out at okay. the end of it was a national health service worth having. Right. So he mentioned the nurses. We can go through the other professions and find comparable okay. conditions. Okay, you, you tell me you're containing your expectations. You sound pretty upbeat, upbeat to me. It's going to be quite a year, isn't it? I'm upbeat for the fight. It's upbeat for the fight, okay. I know, well, and no doubt you're going to be tuning yeah, into the, yeah, yeah. the election station the times radio. The about to blow his whistle, time. and I'm crossing the white line. That's what I feel. It's good to see you, Neil. Take care. <laughs> That's Neil Kinnock, former leader of the Labour Party.